This is the brain, the different pressures on the cerebellum. Now, your cerebellum is an area back here about the size of my fist in the back of your brain back here, and that is you. This is your software. All this stuff about your thinking capacity and all that, you need that, yeah, but this runs you. This is, this is your urine, your, your bowels, your heartbeat, your blood pumping. This is your software that never stops running. This is you. You hurt that, you're dead. Russians, you know, they execute you, they nail you down, one bullet in that, gosh. That, you know, the cerebellum, you just can't go without that. So with this one, as you see, sorry, with the human, all this three pound weight presses down on this. Well, this is designed in such a way that it's in the curve here because it has to hold up for the course of your life in good shape. It can't allow this pressure to come down and squeeze it out of the neck hole mm. because you're gonna, you'll die if that happens. Mm. So it has to be set in place. So it's set in the curve of the back of your head and there are ridges of bone in here that it sets and holds up against so that it's, it's built really, really well to do what it has to do. The star child doesn't have that. Those, those ridges are just down to nubs. They're not really there. And you have all this brain back here pressing down this way, so it's like a, you know, a fat kid going down a slipper slide. It should just be swoosh right out of the neck hole. So when the brain guy, first brain guy saw it, he was doing all this, he says, you know, this thing either doesn't have a cerebellum like we have, or whatever its brain material is made of, it's three or four times harder than ours. It's, it's like much more gelatinous than ours. And our brain is pretty doggone gelatinous. Mm -hmm. It's got to be really, really hard to stay in this head at this angle without coming out of the neck hole. You with me? So again, everything different. Next slide. All right, now, this is the underside and the neck and what it all looks like. Now, this is called the basilar part, and that doesn't really seal in individuals until we're about 25 years old, 20 to 25. Wow. Yeah, so this is kind of loose until then. So this is an adult. It's sealed, but the star child lost theirs. Now, this could have meant it was younger than the sealing age, or it just could have bumped a rock and just knocked it out in the tumble in the water. But nonetheless, the basilar part would be there. Otherwise, everything's the same. It's pretty much the same size. Of, you know, what is it for? The basilar like part the is just part of the brain holding a it's very stout, thick bone that, again, is keeping pressure off of this in the event of a hit in the front. Because if anything happens to this, you're toast. So you've got some protective. You you're, you're, you're remember the things we were just talking about, the yes. tabloid plates that they are? So it's just part of the bracing mechanism, the protecting your your. We've got any ideas about why it doesn't complete itself till 20? It's interesting because I'd always thought people aren't physically complete, completed till they're 25. Keep telling my daughter. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're the first person to ever ask that. I do not know, but it's probably look upable. Right? Okay. I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for you. But what you really see is the difference in the shape and the size of the neck. It's about half the volume and it's an, uh, an oval rather than a circle. Very different. Next slide. Okay, the areas of neck muscle attachment, this is what we were talking about a minute ago. The, you have the, the indentation here of the inion. The neck muscles should be attaching up here if they were human, but you see the fossa down here, and you have this little area of attachment. Big area of muscle attachment here. You can see the giant, the, the width of the fossa right here, which are down to this here. And so you see the size of this, and this is the inion, inion, inion. So just redesign, a complete redesign that's so com so bizarrely different, and yet it's functioning, it's living, it, it, it dies as an adult. We don't know how old. Next slide. It's not a child. The zygomatic arches, cheekbones, and you see just this is a draw-in of what they normally look like, and this is the star child, and you see how, how much compressed the, the lower face is, all the signs of it are. Next slide. This is the chewing muscles. They come up under the, under the cheekbones, and they spread out like this, and all of us, you chew a little bit, and you can feel them moving right up there, and the star child's are right here. About half the volume of chewing muscle attachment. Again, a clear sign that the face is very, very reduced relative to a normal <coughs> face. Next slide. Now, this x-ray showed the star child lacked any vestige of frontal sinuses. You see the frontal sinuses in the human, that's the eye sockets right there, and you see in the star child, it's eye sockets, and you don't see even a vestige of it. Normally when a person is born, even if they're born without sinuses, and you can be born with one of these bigger than the other one, you can be born with screwed up sinuses, but you're just not born with nothing there. That, that's just, you know, your body tries to do it, even if it does it wrong. Mm -hmm. It knows to do that. 
So what your and what your sinuses are for is very interesting. You think it's for uh, helping you with disease and colds and things like that because that's what the the, the, uh, the medicine companies tell you when you do commercials and all your sinuses. Not so. What your sinuses are really for is to make your voice resonant, to make your voice speak like a human. Because if you don't have sinuses, you talk like a robot, like one of those things like that. You have no resonance whatsoever. Right? So, and you hear people that have damaged or very bad sinuses, and that's how they sound. They don't sound, they sound weird. Mm -hmm. So, it's, it's beginning a sign that maybe the star child doesn't speak. The little bitty neck, the lack of the sinuses, the very big brain, this is an indication that maybe it doesn't speak. It communicates by telepathy, which everybody says that's how the greys don't communicate. Mm -hmm. Next slide. All right, the CAT scan shows the star child's inner ears are twice the size, and this is just representative. It's the same thing, but uh, humans are about this size, and the star child's are just double, double as big. Inner ears. Now, why would you have, you know, your inner ears are for your balance. Why would you have need bigger, better balance? Well, if you've got a big head sitting on a skinny little neck, you might need a finer adjustment to, to keep it where it is than just these big muscles that we have that can do that job. Maybe it's a more balanced, a more fine balancing thing, and that's what they would be for. It's the best answer we have. Next slide. Okay, now this is really cool. Um, the exterior surface of bone. In a human, you have these things called lacunae. Now, we've all heard the story that our cells change out every seven years, right? You know, in every seven years, everything but our brain changes out. Well, this is how it does in bone. Bone is constantly coming up through these things and being recycled out, and new bone is coming in, and it happens through the lacunae. All right? Every, all bone has that. Star child doesn't have it, as you see. Now, if you're going to be a deformity, what? Where would that go? And you're going to live. Where would that go? Very important thing. And you see, it's just like little closed out nodes, but they're not, they're not functional. Next slide. All right, this is the mass spectrometry of the human bone, and you see that there are spikes in carbon, oxygen, calcium, phosphorus, oxygen, carbon. But kind of get this in your mind. This is human bone, the way it is set up chemically, by you know, the chemical parts of the bone. Next slide, star child. You look at the difference. Again, the calcium and the phosphorus. Look at the oxygen and the carbon. What is this? What does this look like? You don't know. It's collagen, the collagen of your, of your teeth. Like, your teeth are the hardest bones in your body because it has an overload of collagen. You know, when you have your teeth drilled and you have that horrible icky smell, mm. that smell, we all know that smell, that's burning collagen. It's not burning tooth, it's burning collagen. Mm. And so, what this means is that the star child's bone is solid wall-to-wall -wall tooth. Mm. It's much, much harder than human bone. Next slide. This is the piece of maxilla, the attached piece of maxilla, and that's this piece up here. And you see that it had a nose opening, and you see the two teeth when there were two teeth. You see it here like this. We eventually took this tooth for, for testing, a big mistake, big disaster. But anyway, nonetheless, this is how it looked. Next slide. You'll see it together, and you see those two fused together to make this. But guess what? This is flat. There's no arch at all. This is flat. So it indicates that it has a small tongue or no tongue at all. And that goes again to the idea that maybe it communicates by telepathy. Next slide. Now this is that piece of maxilla after the tooth is gone, but x-ray, so that you can see that it has uninterrupted teeth in there. And when we first took the first x-ray of this, the guy said, well, if you've got uninterrupted teeth and you've got teeth down, it's got to be a child. And that's where the name Star Child came from. Later, we found out that the sutures were of an adult and that these teeth, as you'll see in a minute, are, are heavily worn. So this could be a being that, like a shark, when, it, when its tooth wears down, it can replace, which would indicate that maybe it has a lifespan of 200 years, 300 years, 500 years. We don't know. But it can have a very extended lifespan, and if it did, and if it eats like we do, and it seems to, it's going to need this over time. And there it is. Next slide. So, and here you see this, this tooth when it's pulled out, and it's clearly not a kid tooth. 
but you also see this. This is crazing, what's called uh, crazing. It's cracking of the enamel before death. If these are white, you know it happened post-mortem and it's just the tooth shrinking up as you die. But if it's stained by food, berries, whatever, you know that this is crazing in life. And it's hard. You gotta like chew ice for 10 years to, to crack this. But you can also see the, the chips, 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 where they're eating, eating um, food that's stone ground with a pestle and it's leaving little pieces of grit and they're, they're biting on that. But it's an adult. The whole point of this is this is not a child's tooth. It's an adult. Next slide. Okay, and this shows the cutting. Remember I told you that there was the cutting done and all that? And, and it's, it's pretty extensive and it's unfortunate. And there's stuff cutting on the top of the head too. So uh, I, I hate it, but we've still got the majority of them as you can see. I mean, we've got like 80% left or more, but we have had to. But look at the, you get a good shot, a good difference of the depth of the eye sockets. Uh, very, very different. All right, next slide. How does mainstream science attempt to explain the star child? Well, they say Mother Nature can do anything, create any kind of deformity or mutation or variation, no matter how bizarre or unlikely something looks. Nature is fully capable of it. I don't know why it's not there. But that's their answer, that when, when we would bring these physical differences, these incredible physical differences that would make any real, normal, natural scientist jump up and down and say, boy, this is really cool. We need to find out what this is. This is not something they want to know. This is not something they want to dig into because they know it's going to upset a lot of parts. And so they just say, well, nature can do anything. And I had them tell me that. When I, I, I would say, all these, they, they said, look, I don't care how many of these things you bring me. I don't care how many you bring me. All I have to say is nature can do anything and we win. And it's no different than religion where they say, I don't care what you say. All I got to do is say God can do anything and I win. Exactly. You know? Nature is the god of science, mm. and they use it the same way religion uses God. Mm. They do when things they don't want to deal with. That's that's what they that's their go-to guy is God, and their go-to gal is nature. Mm. And that's that's unfortunate, but it makes it a very very hard road to hoe to get anywhere with these people because they've got you beaten with that. Next slide. Mm.